Brilliant. Okay, so um, thanks for inviting me along this evening. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, bee lines, our insect superhighways. Um, and what I'll do is I'll just sort of introduce um, pollinators, why they're important, talk about the bee lines initiative, um, how it was set up and, and up to you know, where we are today. And then I'll talk a little bit around the habitat needs of, um, of pollinators as well, if, if we got time at the end. So um, feel free to let me know, Andrew, if, uh, if I'm uh, yabbering on and need to <laughs> cut me back. <laughs> so, okay. So um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, um, oops, how do I go back? Oh gosh, sorry, I have to do it on you. I'm not sure if you're all familiar with Bug Life. So we are uh, the Invertebrate Conservation Trust. The aim of our organization is to halt the extinction of invertebrate species and to uh, hopefully achieve sustainable populations. Um, we do this through undertaking a range of different tasks, so anything from practical conservation projects through to uh, engaging with advocacy and policy, uh, raising awareness through outreach events um, and, uh, and education. So it's, it's a wide, um, wide variety of work and uh, we also do um, a fair bit of campaigning on topics such as really high profile important sites. Um, issues such as uh, pesticides and the movement of pot plants and invasive species, that, that type of thing. So in terms of invertebrates, um, in the UK, we've got around about 40,000 different species um, and they provide a lot of really important roles or also known as ecosystem services that, um, that we as, as people do rely a lot on. Um, one of the ones we're most familiar with, of course, is, is pollination, uh, but, but insects um, and uh, invertebrates take part in a range of other services as well. So things like seed dispersal, um, aerating and mixing up our soils, decomposing dead matter, and nutrient cycling and also biological control as well so natural biological control then so for example um, hoverfly larvae that would feed on your your aphids or, or ladybird larvae in, in the garden so um so they're really important to us and provide a range of services for for free um and having a sort of um a healthy robust population of pollinators provides that enhanced pollination service as I mentioned natural pest management is there but there's also a lot of benefits higher up the food chain so um, other insects and invertebrates will eat pollinators as will um, birds fish small mammals reptiles so uh, the really key uh, element of, of the food chain as invertebrates are uh, more broadly um, so having insect pollination is really essential to maintaining a healthy and thriving environment. Um, around about 80% of EU crops are insect pollinated and again around about 80% of the wildflowers that, that we see that, that invertebrates rely upon and, and that we also enjoy um, are also insect pollinated. Um, pollination has also been shown to increase the yield and quality of crops. Um, and for some crops, there's only a certain type of pollination that can be undertaken, and that's undertaken by bumblebees in particular. You may have heard of it, it's known as buzz pollination. So what that means is a bumblebee can actually sort of um, vibrate the muscles of its wings, which sends vibrations to its, uh, its leg and its mouth parts. And it's only that that can dislodge pollen from certain plants. So things like um, blueberries, aubergines, tomatoes, kiwis, um, they can only be uh, pollinated by bumblebees specifically. So time to meet the pollinators. So um, we have around about 6,000 species that undertake pollination in the UK, potentially a bit, bit more than that. And that's made up of um, <clears throat> bumblebees, solitary bees, the honeybee, butterflies, moths, wasps, flies. So it's quite a diverse um, group of, of insects that actually undertake pollination and they themselves then have uh, diverse needs in terms of their habitat requirements. Um, so, uh, in terms of bees, honeybees tend to get a lot of the um, a lot of the limelight, but there are actually two hundred and seventy species of of bee in the UK. Um, so we've got the honeybee, then we've got twenty five species of um, bumblebee, and the rest are solitary bees. So we've got a wide variety of different um, solitary bees. Um, in terms of pollination, obviously honeybees are good pollinators, but um, solitary bees are are more effective, and that's partially because they're a little bit messier. So when um, honeybees collect pollen, they mix it with uh, saliva and put it in their pollen baskets, which so is fairly neat and tucked away. Uh, whereas uh, solitary bees, they don't have that mechanism. They sort of keep it on hairs, on their legs and under their belly. So when they're moving from plant to plant and landing, that's when that sort of pollen gets, gets transferred as well. 
Um, so, so they're a bit messier, which effectively makes them slightly better pollinators. So um, I'm sure you've seen on the media over the past, well, especially over the past year, but, but a bit longer than that, of, of this quite concerning declines in pollinators. So this uh, is a graph showing um, declines in um, I guess bees and, and hoverflies over a sort of 30 year period. You can just see there's that gradual, um, gradual decrease there. And this is from the UK Biodiversity Indicators Report from 2020. So this is up to date um, information for the UK. Um, and I think it was maybe last year or the year before, um, a study was released from Germany, which was a huge, um, a huge undertaking looking at a large number of um, nature reserves. And that showed a 75% decline in, uh, in insect abundance over, over a 27 year period, which is absolutely huge. So that's not telling you necessarily about species, but it's just saying overall, the numbers of pollinators are, are greatly um, decreasing. Um, and the reasons, you're probably familiar with a lot of these, um, so I'll run through them fairly quickly, but we got habitat loss, we've lost between 97 and 98% of our flower rich grasslands since the 1930s, and what that means then effectively is we've got lots of small or fairly small patches in the, in the grand scheme of things, which means areas and habitats and sites become fragmented and then potentially isolated which has impacts for, um, for all invertebrates and wildlife generally, but from a pollinated point of view, um, impacts particularly for those with smaller um, dispersal ranges. We'll come on to that a little bit later. Um, the use of pesticide and herbicide in agriculture, horticulture, but also in our gardens, uh, non-native species, disease and parasites. So some examples of this are commercially reared um, bumblebees or uh, honeybees that that you know escape uh, into the wild and maybe carrying diseases and parasites and then climate change as well so that can sometimes have an effect on the timings of things so when um, species typically emerge or when flowers emerge they they sort of naturally timed to, to fit together but that that can fall out of sync and climate change is a is a factor in that so how can we help our pollinators? So um, back in 2010, there was a, a government uh, requested review called the Lawton Review, quite a famous document. It was focused on, on England, but, but the sort of the, the ethos of it is, is relevant across the UK. And uh, one of the key phrases that's always banded about that came from that report is that um, <clears throat> we need to make our network of sites bigger, better and more joined up. So we need more sites and they need to be a better quality and they need to be connected, basically. Um, and I was mentioning dispersal ranges earlier. So this photograph here is the shrill cardaby. It's one of the rarest bees in the UK. That map there shows the, the locations of, of where it is. It might be slightly out of date now, but, um, but there's essentially five main populations of, of, the, of shrill cardaby, three of which are in uh, Wales. So there's one uh, in the sort of uh, Gwent levels area. One in um, Neath Batalba and uh, Bridgend, around the Kenfig area and the nice brownfield habitats around Neath Batalba. And then on the Castle Martin uh, Peninsula in Pembrokeshire. Now, Shrill Cardaby um, <clears throat> is an interesting example when we look at dispersal areas because the um, from the nest, they typically only uh, disperse around about 200 metres in terms of their forage. And that's, you know, that's no distance at all, really. So if you've got areas where there's not particularly much connectivity, um, then species tend to get isolated and struggle and the genetic pool decreases, etc. So, so that, that sort of connectivity and stepping stone sites in fairly close proximity um, becomes even more important for species that do have shorter ranges. But when we're talking about species moving across the landscape more generally, again, that, that stepping stone of, of habitat is, is really important. <clears throat> so, um, as Bug Life, we with working with um, partners and some universities back in 2011 now, um, built up the idea of, of beelines, which we, we hope is part of the solution to help, you know, rebuild our pollinator uh, populations and, you know, stop the decline and, and uh, improve the situation for them. So the three kilometre wide uh, lines of of wildflower rich habitat or you know to be made into more diverse uh, rich habitats and they link together some of our uh, best sites by enhancing in story uh, restoring and in some cases creating new habitat as i say it's about creating those um stepping stones and linking with um with other uh, important sites um, and it's also really important that it's it's a collaborative approach so 
Um, we, as an organisation, deliver Beelines projects, but we're also happy for other organisations, local groups to be delivering within the Beelines. It's, it's something for everyone. It's just that we're the organisation that sort of spearheaded it, but, but it's there for, for everyone to, to use and, uh, and get involved in. Uh, so, uh, as I say, sorry, it's 2012, not 2011. So back in 2012, um, uh, a colleague who was based up in the northeast sort of piloted um, beelines. And the aim there was to um, identify some corridors, develop guidelines for delivering the beelines, um, get support from, from partners and local communities and, and, and sort of build that network up. So an initial project was delivered with a, a range of um, various partners there. Um, and that sort of set the set the ball rolling really and allowed us to, to trial out what what beelines could could look like and what it could deliver on the ground. Um, and arising from that, there was um, a set of um, delivery guidelines. So we didn't want this to be to be um, complex and, you know, it's not an exact science. And I'll come into the methodology of <clears throat> how the beelines are um, put together a little bit later on. But these are some of the broad sort of um, factors that are in, con in consideration with beelines. So habitat patch size and quality, and we've got landscape wide habitat availability and long distance route design as well. So ideally, um, we're aiming for sites that are greater than two hectares wherever possible. That's not always the case, um, particularly in urban areas. Um, and you know, beelines route should really be connecting up some of our, our best sites. So potentially connecting up, you know, triple SIs, national parks, local wildlife sites, not to say other sites aren't important, but that's how we're sort of, sort of looking at it in the first instance. And then also aiming for the uh, for stepping stones to be between 0.5 or ideally no more than 0.5 or a kilometer um, apart at the most. So in terms of the methodology, I'll just give you an example of the beelines uh, mapping exercise that we undertook in, uh, in South West Wales. So this was done on a regional um, basis across Wales and then regionally across the rest of the UK as well. Um, and the process is um, collating a wide range of data sets, so looking at phase one habitat layers, <clears> triple <throat> SI sites, local wildlife site data. So getting that information from uh, Lurk Wales. So we worked um, closely with WWBIC, the Reco Centre in, in West Wales. Um, and they sort of collect, they do all the snazzy uh, GIS sort of technical stuff for us, basically. This is phase one. So get all our data together, see where our sites are already. And then um, our sort of key sites, like things like um, grasslands and heathlands, and then our, what we're calling beneficial habitats, like fens and um, other sort of similar areas that are useful for pollinators. And then putting those together into one map. Um, and then there's a GIS program called Linkage Mapper. And what, what that does is it, it sort of, um, it uses, <clears throat> um, how do I say it? So it, it links the, where the best areas are basically. And it, it sort of, it does it from a, a range of zero to one, where zero is um, not of any use to pollinators. So for example, hard standing would be classed as zero, whereas say lowland uh, calcareous grassland or coastal calcareous grassland would potentially be a nine or a 10. And it scores the habitats <clears throat> and then it creates potential links across the landscape as to where the bee lines could go. So, you know, where are the best habitats or, or effectively the paths of least resistance? So this is just showing you the sort of the, the way we go through that. So stage one and then stage two is, is the linkage mapper. Stage three shows us our various um, key beneficial habitats. And then following that, then we end up with the end result, which is the, um, the actual beelines network for South and West Wales. I should say that when it comes to the um, to the, producing the final map, that's where we have um, partners involved. So uh, for South West Wales, we had all the relevant local authority ecologists, we had other um, local ecologists attending, local record centre, various interested individuals, because it's, you know, it's all well and good using the habitat data and doing the, the GIS mapping. But what we really want is to get people's input uh, who know the area locally to say, you know, here's a really key area for beelines or it shouldn't go this way because X, Y and Z. So so that really um, features strongly and which is why we, we did it on a regional basis across all of the UK as opposed to like a country basis, because we really want that that local input of knowledge and effectively then local buy in. 
Um, and bee lines is about more than just flowers. It's also about creating the habitats that pollinators need to fulfill all of their requirements within their life cycle. So many invertebrates require a range of different habitats to, to complete their life cycle. So we want to you know, include the, the full package basically. And this is our um, completed, <clears throat> fairly recently completed UK wide map. Um, so the, the Wales map was completed back in, I think it was 2018, um, and we've been building on the other areas of the UK since then. So, um, so yeah, I'm very pleased to see that all of the, the UK... We all see wildflowers as beautiful and great for our well-being, Sorry. but for the thousands of pollinating insects that share this land with us, wildflowers are... Sorry, I wanted to play this video, but it just started playing by itself. Um, Andrew, can you just let me know, can you guys hear that video? Yes, I could hear it. Great. I'll just play yep. this. It's probably, um, I think it's maybe a minute and a half long. So back in March, we had a, um, a Beeline Superhighways launch event because we'd finished mapping uh, the Beelines across the UK. Um, and we produced this short um, animated film as part of that and a, and a Beelines report. So the, the two links in the presentation will take you to these two as well if you want to look at it at them another time. Um, and I'll, I can provide you with the, the slides, uh, Andrew, afterwards as well, if that's of interest. So I'll just see if this But there's a problem. Pollinators are finding themselves in isolated oases, walled in by agricultural land, urban landscapes, roads and gardens. What humans see as neat and tidy, insects see as desert. Since 1940, we've lost 97% of our flower-rich meadows and hundreds of our pollinator species are in decline. At Bug Life, we have come up with a beautiful solution to the problem. Bee Lines, a network of insect pathways along which we are restoring and creating wildflower-rich habitat. These insect superhighways will extend across the whole of the UK, allowing wildlife to move freely through our countryside and towns. But we need your help to make it happen. Restoring fields of wildflowers making space for wildlife in our towns, on road verges, local parks or gardens. Mowing the lawn less often, it's the easiest thing you can do for your local pollinators. Or how about planting a wildflower meadow in your local park or school? Then add your project to the Beelines map. Help us make our network of habitats bigger, better and more joined up. Find out more at budlife.org.uk. Saving the small things that run the planet. We all see. There we go. For some reason, it just sort of keeps going around on a loop. So I'll just click off that page. Um, but I say you, you've got the links there if I want to look into that further. So focusing in on Wales, then. So um, as I say, we completed the mapping of uh, bee lines in Wales back in about 2018 now, um, and that was paid for through um, funding by the Welsh government and also the Trunk Roads um, Associations in Wales. And we worked closely with the, uh, the local record centres who provided us with all the various uh, different forms of habitat data that, that we required, in addition to other information we collated elsewhere. Uh, so I just thought I'd tell you a little bit about a project we're delivering at the minute. So um, as I say, you know, as, as Bug Life, we, we deliver Beelines projects with partners, but it's also something for partners to use to maybe help inform their projects or prioritise areas that they might want to um, connect up as well. So at the minute, we are delivering uh, the Neath Patalbert Beelines project. That started in October of last year, and it's a three-year uh, heritage lottery funded project. So um, what we decided to do, because whilst the Bee Lines does focus, focus down, you know, Wales into these corridors, they're still huge areas because they're, they're three kilometres wide inland and a, and a kilometre and a half along the coast. So it's still a, quite an extensive area of land. So with the Neath Talbot Bee Lines project, we're trying to focus on some, some key areas. Um, so what this map shows is um, the areas in blue are existing habitats. We see we've got um, Kenfig National Nature Reserve there. We've got Tata Steel, which supports some really nice brownfield habitat and Chilcardi be known to be present um, at Tata Steel. And then um, for the bit north then in the county, we've got um, Knoll Park. Um, and one of the areas that we wanted to focus on was really this um, this area sort of in sort of like Sandfields 
type area along the coast there, along Port Talbot. Um, and what we're trying to do there is, is to build that connectivity. So we've got the, the little circles, um, the little red circles within the, the yellow area there. Those are some of our project sites that we're going to be working on over the next three years or so. Um, the smaller sites are um, housing association land and also the local health board land. And then just below that yellow circle there, you can see um, Crumlin Burroughs Triple SI. And then just below that is um, the Swansea University Bay Campus. So we're working in partnership with Swansea University to create some habitat um, on the campus itself and also do some work on Crumlin Burroughs. Again, creating that connectivity uh, along the coastline, linking up to uh, to some of the other sort of important existing areas like steelworks and kenfig um, and then next to the knoll then we're working on a large um working with the woodland trust at a large uh, site they've recently acquired called uh, brunei farm i'll just tell you about some of these so um yes yeah, so brunei farm is is huge it's 72 um hectares it's going to be open to the public by the woodland trust probably sometime next year uh there's a bit of a blank canvas at the moment um the site is being um, planted up with trees in a lot of areas but it's quite diverse there's a range of habitats there from some ancient semi-natural woodland through to scrubs areas of of grassland including improved but also unimproved areas and, and marshy areas there's streams there's ponds so it's quite a diverse site um, the picture here shows all the uh, the tree planting that the Woodland Trust has done and what they've done is they've come in um, quite sort of methodically with, with a bucket to, to take out the soil then flipped it over and they planted the trees within that, um, that mound. Uh, so as part of the the Leith Talbot project, we've um, we've we've come along and worked with the Woodland Trust volunteers and we've sown some seeds um, on wildflower seeds um, on the mounds in the hope that the grassy areas then don't come and, and sort of dominate the trees and we're also then providing um, forage for, uh, for insects. So it'll be useful, in, sorry, interesting to see how that, that progresses over time. And then this autumn we're going to be um, enhancing a, a grassland in an adjacent field using seed um, obtained from a coronation meadow in, uh, in Swansea. So it'll be locally, uh, locally harvested seed that, that we'll be using on that site, which is always when, when you ask of seeding, that's always the, the preference for it to be as locally sourced as possible. Um, and um, these are quite a rare breed. These are Welsh whites that, that will be um, grazing on the site as well. So in terms of managing areas, um, conservation grazing is, is a, an amazing tool in terms of um, enhancing wildflower areas. So this is um, Crumlin Burrows and the Swansea Bay uh, University campus. If you're familiar, it's just off um, Fabian Way in Swansea. Um, so at Crumlin Burrows, we were um, helping with the work with regards to a removal of Japanese rose, so Rosa rugosa. Um, and the method there is to actually um, dig the rose out uh, and then dig a fairly deep um, hole around about two meters, place the, the rose in that and, and cover it up. Um, so that's helping to, to remove the invasive species. When it's covered up then it's creating some nice sort of open uh, newly formed bare, bare sand habitat um, and as I say it's you know taking that that non-native species out and allowing the natural flora to um, to flourish and then on the uni campus um, I mean it's a fairly new campus um, and they've got some quite interesting sort of mounds and, and tumps of earth some of them have quite interesting pHs as well so we're potentially going to be doing some work with, with the students there um, and again purchasing either locally sourced seed or locally sourced plug plants in some instances that are that would be appropriate to the local area and uh, doing some enhancement of, of those areas and also discussing with um, the grounds maintenance team there about how to manage those those sites. Uh, another site um, is uh, is called Giant's Grave. Uh, this is a lovely site uh, within the, the bee lines in uh, in Neath, and it's really important for quite a wide diversity of um, of bees, and particularly solitary bees. One of the rarer um, of them being the, the longhorned bee uh, down in the bottom right of the of the picture there. And um, you can see this is the male um, of, of the longhorned bee with this really long uh, antennae. So it's a really really uh, cool species to to see. Um, and they're on the wing sort of July, sort of June, July time is, is a good time to potentially see them. And they're known sort of from coastal areas in South Wales, but also sometimes a bit more inland um, on, particularly on sort of like brownfield habitats, which are quite important. 
So the shaded areas on this site just show some some of the um, part of the site where we might be doing some work. So there's a quite a bit of heathland on the site, but it's being encroached by um, by birch and scrubs and maybe some clearance there. Um, recreating some scrapes to create um, bare ground, which is really really important. Nesting habitat, widening some rides, and discussing with the council who own this site um, about about grassland management and and how we can work together to. Uh, to ensure that the um, the insect and you know pollinated populations um, are protected and hopefully enhanced. So some of our other partners then, as I say, are housing association sites and the Swansea Bay University Health Board. So more typically, their sites are what we'd consider sort of amenity grassland. But again, in the first instance, it's it's about looking at what's there already. So. Um, discussing with with grounds maintenance um, managers around cutting frequency. You know, can the cutting be um, be reduced in some areas? Because typically it can be quite frequent through you know from March through to September. Um, and looking at what what flora we have um, in the sward. So that's that's sort of the main steps that we're uh, undertaking initially. Um, with some of the housing association sites, um, we we'll we are doing consultation with with residents who live within those areas. To get a feel for you know what they think about nature and and pollinators and the concept of beelines and what they would like to see on their doorstep because that's that's obviously very um, important as well. And a couple of other elements of the project. So we're working with uh, uh, an artist, uh, a fairly local artist called Tom Maloney. He's done that um, that really nice painting at the top there and done a, a sort of cartoon sketch of the Longhorn Bee, which I think is really cool. Um, he's going to be engaging with school children in the local area. So in uh, in, in Neath and Batalbert and Baglan areas um, and doing a variety of different tasks with them, but just you know getting them um, interested and excited. So Initially, um, because of our current situation, it's going to be sort of remotely done, but hopefully um, later on in the year or potentially next year, you can go, go actually uh, into schools. Um, and we plan to make a short video in uh, English and in Welsh um, and animation and getting the kids doing activities to get them thinking about, about pollinators. Um, we're also going to be encouraging people to um, undertake pollinator monitoring as part of the POMS citizen science scheme, um, the Bee Walk scheme, which is a bumblebee conservation trust led um, bumblebee monitoring uh, scheme. And we're, they're a partner on, on our project. And um, we're also encouraging uh, anyone who does record as part of the project to, to submit their records to, um, to SUBREC. Uh, and this is just an example of some of our partners there. So as I say, some of the main ones are uh, the Woodland Trust, uh, the local council, Bombay Conservation Trust, housing associations, uh, and health board and Swansea Uni as well. So, um, so we've got a good, good mix of um, organizations um, as well. And we're also trying to um, input into sort of some uh, mindfulness and family friendly walks. So there's um, a partner called Nature on Your Doorstep. who will be doing those activities with families and with staff from uh, and students from Swansea University and with health board staff as well. So it's just that getting out in, in nature and, and experiencing it and hopefully trying to shut off from uh, everything that's going on around us. So that's just a bit of a run through to give you uh, an idea of the types of um, things you can do with beelines and, and the variety of sites. So just using the Neath Batalba project as an example, we'll be working in, you know, densely urban areas, coastal sites, woodland sites, heathlands, some brownfield sites. In previous projects, we've worked on coal spoil sites. Um, some of our other beelines projects, more so in England, have been very much sort of farmer landowner um, lead sites so, you know quite big chunks of land. So it's, you know, it can it can work anywhere really. It's, it's it's sort of a quite a flexible project that or initiative that, that really anybody can get involved in. So um, so that's what I, I really like about about beelines. So I'll just run through um, some of the sort of considerations around um, pollinators uh, in terms of their habitats. So um, forage resource, so pollen and nectar is very important. Uh, nesting habitat, shelter and overwintering and a variety of habitats or mosaic of habitats. So uh, flower power. So it's really important to um, when you've got your um, your your sites or your your areas of land. If you're wanting to attract pollinators throughout the season, so early spring through into into autumn, it's a really good idea to think about the the varieties of um, of wildflowers that that you may may have. 
uh, and how to enhance that. So um, everything from so some of the early ones like the uh, white dead nettle there in the top left, um, really good for for early emerging species like uh, queen bumblebees and some some of our solitary bees that are out quite early. Um, in the top right there, we've got um, a hoverfly on an oxide daisy. Um, species like oxide daisy, they're, um, they're sort of composites and they're really good for generalist pollinators who don't have long tongues like, like bumblebees do or, or butterflies and moss and can access the pollen and nectar quite easily. So um, a variety of um, shapes, flowering, flowering times as well. So shapes of flowers and, and you know, when they, uh, when they do come out and flowers is really important. Ivy is a really good flower for, uh, for later in the year. So again, thinking about times for, for cutting, if, you know, if cutting can be delayed into, into later in the year, potentially, then species that are on the wing come July and August and September, and that includes the shrill cardaby, it's active that, that late in the season, then they will all, all benefit from it as well. So yeah, so here's some examples of um, early and late flowering um, species. As I said, I can provide um, this, this presentation so you can sort of um, take note of these. Um, as I say, con consider delaying cutting to allow wildflowers to set seed. And it can also be done on a rotational basis as well so that you've got some areas uh, that are taller, some areas that, that are shorter, um, just to have that, that sort of variety within, uh, within the sward. Um, so this is more for like what are potentially more formal areas or areas that do have to get cut more often than um, then species like self heal and clover, birds for trefoil, buttercups and dead nettles. Those types of species can actually withstand fairly frequent cutting. So if it's just let to, uh, allowed to grow that little bit more, then um, it can still be providing resource for pollinators whilst also being um, you know, an area that can still be used for amenity purposes whatever they may be. So, so those types of species can withstand more, more frequent mowing. So um, some uh, species of, of wildflower do, uh, do get quite a bad rap, um, you know, some understandably. So ragwort here in the top left. Um, obviously, we know that that's, you know, if, if that sort of dries up and gets into silage, then that's really um, you know, detrimental to um, to sheep or, or other animals that, that graze it. When it's out in the field in flower, um, you know, horses and ponies um, tend tend not to graze it. I've seen horses in fields covered in ragwort, but they, they're not actually eating it. Um, but, you know, it's, as I say, when it is highly toxic, so when when it does get consumed, it's uh, it's not good for, for the animals um, that are grazing on it. Um, so it, it is an issue in that sense. But, you know, there are potentially ways around it, like having it maybe just in, in pockets in the field, if, if that's possible, depending on what, what grazing animals are there. Um, and, you know, it's really important for, I think it's around about 30 species of pollinator totally depend on, uh, on ragwort. So the cinnabar moth, the, the picture in the middle there, that species is totally dependent on ragwort and has suffered quite significant declines. It was uh, a very common species, but it's, it's less so now. Um, the caterpillars are quite, um, I'm sure you've all seen the caterpillars um, munching away on ragwort. They, um, they're quite bold and brass because they're eating the plant, they're taking on the plant's toxins. So I'm sure the odd one might get munched or attempted to get munched, but, um, but you know, the animals that, that do that will learn that they really don't taste very good. And, and it's the same for the adults as well. So that's quite a useful technique. Um, the top right there is a picture of shrill cardaby um, on, on thistle. Again, another another species that um, can sometimes be a little bit maligned. And the, the picture on the bottom there is a picture wing fly, the gall of that fly on uh, on creeping thistle as well. So it's just thinking about you know the importance of, of a variety of wildflowers. And are you able to have some of these more more rural species, or may be perceived as less desirable species in in areas of your land, if that's appropriate. So um, hedges are a really important feature. Um, some of the early pollen and nectar sources come from um, from sallows or from willows, and there's sort of like a blossom sequence throughout the year, following into blackthorn, hawthorn, cherry, and bramble, rose. So that just gives that continuity of a um, of forage resource, which is really really important, as I mentioned earlier, particularly earlier on in the year for early emergent species, and then right the way through to the to the summer and autumn. Um, and 
where you have hedges then it's really nice where next to the hedge you can have tall tusky grassland and potentially scrub and maybe sort of shorter areas of grassland so those range of um range of habitats next to each other basically um and they provide you know um the tussocky sort of scrubby areas can provide nesting habitat um areas for invertebrates particularly warm flooding invertebrates to to sort of um, sit there and bask and get heat over winter and also just to, to shelter and to rest as well so it's it's um, really important habitat so um as i mentioned earlier forage distance is really important for for some pollinators um and in some instances food and and, and nesting um, habitat is really needed in quite close proximity um, and flight um, dispersal distances can range from 100 or so meters through to several kilometers for for some pollinators so um so yeah that's that's where that connectivity really does um come into its own then in terms of its importance so nesting habitat so just thinking about um solitary bees here for for a minute um open exposed areas of um of bare soil is can quite often be a bit of a forgotten habitat feature on a site. So this picture on the left here just so shows some natural sort of paths and open bare areas. And um, you can just see um, at the bottom there, that's a, an ashy mining bee. You might be seeing those at the minute. They're a sort of fairly early spring species, really nice sort of gray and black stripey. And the picture at the top there, you can just see this is um, a burrow that a solitary bee has created in the ground. You can just see the little mounds of soil. So those um, those bare ground areas are really important for creating the burrows. Um, and also because it's bare ground, it, it sort of warms up more quickly compared to its surrounding areas, which the uh, which is required by the, the solitary bees um, and for their larval development. So, um, so it's a really important uh, habitat. <laughs> Um, in terms of um, other forms of solitary bee habitats, so bee banks, so whether that's a natural um, cliff face, like you can see in the left, or bee banks that have been constructed, so the photo on the right there, again, these are really important. Um, so you get them occurring naturally through slippages, or they could be, you know, cliff faces, that type of thing, um, and certain species of solitary bee will, will use them, or they can be created through, um, through piling up, um, it could be like waste materials, like... Um, rubble and hardcore capping that with sand. Um, typically they're made in a bit of a horseshoe shape, but there's no exact science to them. Um, uh, but we've created them through, through Beelines projects and other more urban projects as well on like allotments, country parks, nature reserves, and they provide good nesting habitat. Um, and also a little variety of, of um, sort of microclimate in terms of their south facing and north facing aspects and the fact that they're curved. And over time, they'll become vegetated as well, which means other insects and vertebrates will, will begin to use them. So just to sort of stress the importance of, uh, of nesting habitat. Um, and also if you wanted to, to add that, whether that's in a, you know, a garden setting or a site, um, you can sort of add solitary bee homes. I'm sure you've all sort of seen these and also the big, big bug hotels, which aren't really not necessarily for pollinators. Pollinators may use them if they got the right, um, right materials in them, but they're good in terms of shelter for invertebrates, but also like maybe small mammals or, or amphibians, that type of thing. So they're just, it's a really nice activity just to make a big, a big bug hotel. So um, in terms of the solitary bee homes, though, when when they're being sited, it's important that they're in um, quite a nice sort of sunny area outside of prevailing winds and if at all possible, waterproofed so that the um, the tubes themselves don't get wet. Um, and you may notice, depending on what um, what plants you have in your garden or on your site, um, that you may have some active solitary bees. So leaf cutter bees there, you can just see them. Um, that picture on the left where they've just taken out those sort of semicircles and that's what they'll use to seal up their their burrows and um wool carder bees uh, really nice chunky solitary bees will actually use um fibers off um, plants such as lamb's ear so lamb's ear is really sort of nice sort of fluffy sort of hairy leaves and that's what they'll use within their burrows so it's uh interesting to look for those those signs um, dead and decaying wood, whether that's logs or dead wood, stumps, that type of thing, um, again, that's useful. It's useful for pollinators, so some species will use like old holes made by um, fly beetle larvae, but then also dead wood in itself is a really nice feature to have on a site. It provides, um, whoops, sorry, I clicked on a bit quicker, it provides lots of, um, lots of diversity as well. 
Um, so for things like, you know, spiders, beetles, wood lice, worms. Um, and it's also good if you do have chunks of dead wood, if you're ever doing, um, you know, mini beast hunts, whether it's with schools or children or whatever it may be, then uh, you always find stuff under there. So, yeah, it's a really, um, really nice, nice feature to, to add to your site. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so in terms of nesting and overwintering, retaining taller vegetation over the over the winter months can be quite beneficial. So this photo is is of teasel. Um, so it's it, uh, when it's sort of when it's sort of gone over it, um, you've got the seed head there, which birds love. But you also got the, the hollow stems and um, within the, within the actual head of teasel as well. If you've ever sort of opened one up, there's like a sort of hollow tube within the middle. Um, and quite often you'll find invertebrates, not much sure how they get in there, but um, invertebrates over overwintering in there as well. Um, tussocky vegetation is, is also useful for for overwintering. So it's having those. What might be considered, you know, maybe messy or unkept areas as part of a as part of a site. Um, again, actually provides that that habitat that's really important. Oh, sorry, that slide should have been up with the woodland one. Actually, sorry about that. So that's just showing the you know, variety of different species that you might get with in association with with deadwood and lots of beetle and and fly larvae use it. So it's it's such a such an important resource. So um, really recommend it wherever possible. And there's a variety of forms. So it could be standing deadwood, fell deadwood, or if you wanted to um, increase or push on the process of decay, partially burying some deadwoods, the moisture from the soil gets into it uh, more, more quickly, then that's another um, good way as well. <laughs> Um, water is quite important for um, for pollinators. So um, there are species of hoverfly, for example, that have aquatic larvae. So they let lay their eggs in uh, in water. Um, so it's really important um, for them to have access. Also, then the vegetation around um, water bodies, whether that's ponds or or ditches. Again, those flowers are providing resource. Um, and you can also do things like um, if you know if there's not a scope for for a pond. Uh, in an area, you can do really simple things like hoverfly lagoons. I'm not sure if you ever heard of those, but it's that picture on the bottom left there where it's basically just like a tub or a pot um, with some leaves and some wood, just like some twigs or and that type of thing in it. Um, so you got like where the vegetation then will kind of rot and start to decay. Uh, but that's the type of habitat that some um, hoverflies uh, particularly love. So leaving that outside, it won't be long before you'd see um, little larvae sort of squiggling around uh, in the water. So if you've got limited space, that's something that's, you know, that that can be done that, that adds um, adds variety. Uh, in, my, um, in my garden, I've got a small, I don't know if they're called Belfast sinks or something. I've dug it into the ground and tried to make a mini pond there. So it's, it's not very big, but uh, I'll give it a go. It's like I can't have a pond in my garden because uh, the dog would just go swimming every day. So it'll be interesting to see how that progresses over the spring and summer. And as I probably mentioned before, a variety of habitats equals a variety of invertebrates. And, you know, it doesn't have to be rare species. It's just having, you know, supporting nice, uh, nice assemblages. So in the in the top, um, top left there, you've got the garden cross uh, orb spider. Um, so that likes nice sort of tall grassy areas to, uh, to make its web. Um, top right there, we've got, you may have seen, seen this guy, some nice sort of uh, nice metallic green color. This is the male, the thick, thighed flower beetle. So it's just a male that has those big thick thighs. Down in the bottom left there, we've got um, the dark edged bee fly. Um, that's a species that's out in uh, early spring. It's actually a parasite of, um, of solitary bees. So what the female will do, you may see them, they're sort of buzzing around quite quickly. Just, if you just glance at them, you might think it's a hoverfly, but they're sort of fluffy like, like bees, basically. Um, and they sort of hover around um, looking for solitary bee nests. And the female sort of tries to flick her eggs into the nest. If she's successful, they'll then um, hatch out and munch through the female's reserves, including her her eggs as well. Um, but you know, the success rate of, of them actually achieving that is minimal, so they don't have um, particularly negative impacts on, on solitary bees at all. Um, but where you do see bee flies, then you know you've got solitary bees in your area, and uh, they're really, um, really lovely, um, lovely beasts, really nice to see. Um, yeah, so uh, it's, yeah, again, it's, it's that variety that's that's really important there. And this, this random shield bug that I had in my garden, I really like shield bugs. Um, again, you quite often see them basking on uh, vegetation, like whether that's bramble or, or leaves and that type of thing, just, just catching a, a, bit of, uh, a bit of sun there. So, um, amenity and formal areas. 
Um, again, you know, it's, can can the cutting on certain areas be left? And sometimes it's really surprising what you uh, might might find when areas are left, even areas that may have been amenity cut for for years, even when they get when they get that opportunity to actually. Um, for the wildflowers to actually, uh, you know, grow, it's surprising what you can find. Even sort of, you know, um, this is a bee orchid in the centre of the picture. There, you know, you always hear stories of bee orchids popping up, you know, on, well, on brownfield sites, but on road verges, um, you know, just places you, you think, oh, there'd never be anything special there or different. So it's just giving giving it that that opportunity. So another option for some of the more formal areas or areas that do need more frequent cut is just to raise the the cut a little bit um, as well, just to to give um, the, the flowers and the seed bank that, that chance. Um, and allowing some areas to you know, grow wild or grow, grow a bit messy. So again, you know, it, it could be roadside verges, um, but you know, thinking about um, where you may have more formal areas, like in a park, so that picture on the right there, where there's like a football pitch uh, that's you know, sort of bowling green mown, but then to the edge of that then, you've got a, a wildflower area. So it, you know, it, it sort of works with um, all of the interests in the site. Um, compost heaps are, are really great. So um, you can um, sometimes um, I've seen pictures of uh, bumblebee nests within compost heaps, but they're also really good for um, well, for invertebrates more generally in terms of the decomposition of them, uh, but also things like grass snake and slowworm may use them. Um, so uh, really nice features to have um, on your site or, or in your garden, if at all possible. Uh, so pesticides. So um, as bug life, we really advocate um, not using pesticides uh, and herbicides and other chemicals. Um, they're not only harmful to pollinators, but also other wildlife as well. Um, it's surprising what you can actually get in uh, or buy in, uh, in, in garden centres. Um, you know, you can even buy sprays that are neonicotinoids, you know, in garden centres, you can come home and, and spray that in your garden and, and maybe, you know, potentially unwittingly know, uh, you know, know that, uh, not know, sorry, um, of the harm it's doing. So, um, so some insecticides like neonicotinoids are neuro, neurotoxins, so they, um, they affect the, the behaviour of, of insects, don't necessarily kill them outright, but they, they affect, with, uh, affect their behaviour. Um, which means then sometimes they're not able to um, find their way back home or they may, um, you know, struggle to, um, to behave in their normal ways. Um, so, yeah, so they're really, uh, really detrimental. Um, so just coming back to the um, to the beelines, I wanted to mention that um, there is an interactive beelines map on our website um, and if uh, you are within the bee lines, we'd really love to hear from you. So you can just sort of basically log into the website and just tell us what um, what your patch of land is, how big it is. I think you can add a photo if you want as well. And what that does is just helps us to create dots on the map. So, you know, through our projects, we're putting all our dots on, but also we're asking all of our other partners to add information onto the map and, and add their dots. So it'd be really nice to um, to have some uh, some dots there from the uh, from the Meadows group. Um, as to where your your sites are it's just a visual way then to show us where where we've got connectivity maybe where our blank spots are that we really need to focus delivery so um yeah it'd be great if you could um take a look and, and add your site to the map if you wanted to and we've got a link there at the bottom of the um the bottom of the slide I think Claire uh, has dropped out. Um, it's all gone quiet. Uh, I'll see if 
uh, I can email her and I'm not sure if she realizes she's dropped out. So I'll just see if I can get in touch with her. Well, we're all still here except Claire. Claire's the one who's uh, dropped out, I'm afraid. Um, I've emailed her to um, warn her that <laughs> we can't see or hear her anymore, but whether she'll see that, I don't know. So she might come back. Uh, I hope she does. Um, meanwhile, uh we might as well unmute ourselves and see if uh any if if anyone's got any comments about the talk so far uh if you use the buttons bottom left you can turn your camera and microphones on <laughs> one th thing i was going to ask uh if we ever see claire again <laughs> is looking at the map of the b lines over the uk they were quite densely packed over most of england and very sparse in scotland wales and devon and cornwall and i was just wondered why that was I, I can't believe there are fewer um, wildlife valuable sites in those places. So I was uh, be but very mainly, interested. Mainly upland areas, weren't they, uh, Andrew? That do you think? could be why. Yes. Yeah. I mean, obviously uh, they're more exposed, and so you don't get so many insects up there. I guess it could be that. Yeah. And not only that, I suppose they're mostly unimproved lands as well. So uh, possibly might be more diverse. She's back. Ready? She is. Ready. <laughs> She's back. So oh, sorry about that. I do not know what happened there. Technically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where do you do you know where it where you went off? I think I do. I carried on talking for a while, and I was like, no, nah, no one's there. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. So, okay. I if you can carry on from where you got to, and if the rest of us can mute ourselves again, and then we'll come back. Sure, right, okay. Um, oh, bear with me. Uh, okay, so I think I was on the citizen science page. If that's, that's it. Yeah, ah, nice. Okay, so um, from current slide. So I'm not sure how far I waffled into that, but um, I think it was just I was still on the pollet and monitoring scheme. Just to say it's it's a really good scheme. It only takes um, the ID down to like bumblebee or butterfly or moth levels. So you don't have to necessarily identify to species level. Um, and it's something that anyone can get involved with without any prior experience. So um, so if anyone's interested in, in sort of doing some basic recording, I'd really, um, really encourage the, the pollet and monitoring scheme. Um, I mentioned the Bee Walk survey scheme that Bumblebee Conservation Trust do. 
I know that um, I think maybe you said Andrew that Claire Flynn has done a talk recently. So if, if so, yeah. then, um, she would have mentioned the um, Skills for Bees uh, project that, that she's running. Again, another really good scheme. And then there's um, annual monitoring schemes like the Big Butterfly Count, Moth Night, um, Every Flower Counts, and um, Plant Life have recently launched their cowslip survey as well. So, um, so yes, there's quite a few bits and pieces there that, you know, if you are interested in, in looking at what you've got, that, you know, it can feed into national, uh, national data sets, really, which provides really important information on um, insect pollinator trends. Um, it's not... Well, it's kind of linked to pollinators, but it's partly because I just love oil beetles. But um, we're in oil beetle season at the minute, so I don't know if we've ever seen these creatures before. Um, so like the bee fly, they are linked to um, solitary bees, as in they're, they're parasitic on them. So um, the larvae of oil beetles, if they're very lucky, they, they sort of run up flowers and they'll land on any, any insect that, that lands on the flower, basically. If they're lucky enough to get onto a solitary bee and back to a, a burrow, They'll do a similar thing as with the bee fly in terms of munching through all the resources and the solitary bee um, uh, egg, uh, and um, and that's where they'll sort of um, pupate and um, pop out in the spring. So these are pictures of um, a black oil beetle on the left and a violet oil beetle on the right. Um, but they're they're really nice creatures, um, spring active, daytime um, species that you might get in uh, in sort of grassland or or with the case of violet oil beetles and grassland type woodland habitats, black oil beetles are more so likely to see towards um, towards the coast. Uh, but if, if you do encounter oil beetles, it would be really um, great, again, if you could submit your records and that link that's provided at the bottom there will take you through to the um, UK oil beetle recording schemes that was only set up earlier this year. And you can submit your data through um, this various ways so you can um, message the the recorder scheme person or you can submit it through like iRecord or the Wales Lurk app or different different ways but it would be really good to get more information on oil beetles in Carmarthenshire. I had a quick look at the um, the distribution map for these two species quickly before the presentation and there's not many records for Carmarthenshire at all so um, yes yeah, so if you do encounter them it'd be it would be great if you had the um, had the time to to submit your records um, and a picture is really helpful as well because black and violet oil beetles it's quite easy to tell the difference between male and female because sort of Males have these really sort of kinked antennae. They've got a very obvious notch in them, whereas the females are more, it's, it's much less defined. So male and females is easy to sort of uh, distinguish. Um, but between the species is quite difficult. You need to look at the, um, the thorax basically. Um, and it's quite a small feature on the thorax that tells the difference. So if you submit your records, a, a nice photograph looking top down onto the beetle would be really good. But, but they're associated with grasslands and solitary bees. So I thought I could, uh, I could get that in there at, at the end. Um, and yeah, that's that's about it, really. And a bit of a whistle stop tour of um, pollinators and, and bee lines. OK, well, thank you very much indeed, Claire. And, and you, you started exactly where you stopped. Uh, oh, that's good. So, yeah. <laughs> That, that was great. So right. if if everyone would like to unmute themselves. Uh, and Claire, you can stop sharing your screen. Stop share. There we go. That's it. Uh, when you disappeared, we were just discussing amongst ourselves. Um, the map of the UK and the B line shown on it, they they seem sort of quite densely packed in England and not and rather sparse in Devon and Cornwall and Scotland and Wales. And Richard was wondering, One is that is because that. of upland or why well, do you think that is? Yeah, so there was a, a set of sort of um parameters I guess when when doing the bee lines and one of them was that there would be a, a cutoff level uh, in terms of more more higher ground and upland areas um, so in England uh, I think the layer was like it was linked to agri-environment as to at what stage are you are you saying the land is upland and in Wales we had a sort of a similar approach where we'd cut off at <laughs> certain heights basically not to say that there aren't pollinators in, in upland areas at all but 
I guess it was just to, to connect up to them. So like, for example, in, uh, in South Wales, we connect up to the beacons, but we don't go over them. Um, and in, with the beelines, it's particularly in the workshops, it's difficult because there's so much good habitat and all the, all the sort of partners and interested parties are around the table. Everybody wants a line, you know, in the patch that, that they're interested in or, or care about. So they had to try and be quite, uh, not mean, but, uh, you know, just make it so that they weren't everywhere. But I think in, in some of the areas, perhaps it uh, may have got a little bit, a little bit carried away. <laughs> it's so hard, though, narrowing it down. That's the problem with, you know, when you do these types of exercises, there's areas that are in and there's areas that are out. But, you know, like what I always say when I'm doing the beelines talks, I'm mindful that people may think, well, my site's not in the beelines. Does that mean it's not important? Um, and the answer, of course, is, is no, not at all. I just see the beelines as, well, like the title of the talk suggests superhighways, like motorways, but you know, if we only had motorways in the UK, we wouldn't we wouldn't get to many places. So uh, you need the A roads, the B roads, and the tracks as well, and that's what everything else is. So it, it all you know all adds up basically. Yeah, we we there has been some discussion a few months ago, and I think I contacted you about it. Um, the the interactive B lines website. It, it doesn't seem to allow you to register sites that are already in existence, like, you know, long established yeah. meadows. Yeah. Um, <coughs> and, and also from what you were saying earlier, I think we're the, those of us who are popping up on the screen at the moment, <laughs> our sites aren't big enough, really. They're, I mean, for example, outside where I'm sitting at the moment, we've got two small fields that are meadows, mm -hmm. um, but they're, the total area of that is about two acres, which is mm -hmm. a lot less than, than uh, you were, uh, you know, saying are the main sites that you're focusing on. And then you get your GIS system to join them up in the least circuitous route our sites aren't really big enough are they yeah well i wouldn't be put off by that at all to be honest because um for a couple of reasons firstly the that minimum of two hectares is just like an ideal scenario so that doesn't preclude anything smaller than it um so like you know in the neat patel the beelines project for example with the housing association patches we're working on they're tiny some of them are like i don't know 10 meters by three meters but there's lots of little patches and again it's, it's creating those little little stepping stones and also like you say you know your your patches are maybe two acres but your adjacent neighbor could be doing something similar that's beneficial that might be five acres or it could be half an acre and they kind of bolster each other and and build up so so that's sort of minimum of two hectares it's under the guiding principles but it's just that, you know, overall, yes, it'd be great if we have all, you know, lots of massive sites that are, you know, full of wildflowers and habitat mosaics, but but it doesn't have to be um, by any means. So, yeah, please don't be um, put off by that. Okay. Um, and just going back to your first point there, so it's quite interesting because I I, <laughs> I raised that with a, with um, one of my colleagues and we had a bit of a team discussion about what it. What about the existing sites? About the existing yeah. sites, yeah. And he was a little bit reluctant to put existing sites and not all of us agreed so that's currently under review so I'd say thanks for raising that because I, I get what you're saying because on the map we want to see what's what's already out there um you know so if you're managing your areas as as meadows then far I'm concerned it you know it should should be a should be a dot on the map so that is yeah. an ongoing conversation <laughs> and um there's obviously scope to to um amend amend that form that's not a problem to do that at all so i'm hoping that 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 may happen in the near future and well if it know. doesn't should, do we pretend that they're brand new even if they're not <laughs> well you didn't hear it from me but if it was me i'd, well, I'd probably put it on <laughs> <laughs> okay um in the chat alison uh says on the decline of pollinators list claire mentioned non-native species especially plants she mentioned rugosa rose what else should we be careful to avoid planting um well ooh. i guess is that maybe from a sort of garden perspective more so it, than a 
Well, I've got a meadow, which I'm trying, I've planted about 100 trees, mostly which are native. Yes. But for example, I have put some witch elm in, I've put one Italian alder, I've put a holm oak, and I'm just thinking maybe I've got a bit too clever. <laughs> it should have stuck to my alders and willows. I mean, some species can take over quite easily. So I mean, I don't know, things like um, uh, Budlia, um, Rhododendron, those types yeah. of things, they do have a tendency yeah. to to take over. Um, so I'd avoid those, even though, you know, it's, it's it feels a little bit contradictory sometimes because Budlia, you know, it's, it's covered with butterflies and bees, but it's just, it's not native and, and, it, and it can, it can take over. So those types of species, I would certainly avoid planting. So sea buckthorn at 500 meters, that's not going to romp away at 500 meters, is it? 500 foot, sorry. It's not going to romp. I don't know, probably not. Yeah. <laughs> Depends on the habitat, yeah. surely. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 if it's a dry sort of um, uh, well-draining habitat, it'll it'll romp away, as you say. I mean, it's it's good at colonising culture, for instance, away from the coast. There's but, nothing uh, dry about where I live. No, okay, well, you should be all right. <laughs> but the trouble is, you know, um, if it's going to produce a lot of berries and the birds then scatter them around. Uh, then that's the danger. I, I mean, I would personally avoid it myself under all circumstances. Okay. Same, same as, might, uh, as Japanese yeah. rose as well. Mm. Yeah, I might take it out. Thank yeah. you. Right. Tell the landscape architects as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is quite interesting what what gets planted on you know new new schemes, whether it's houses or or offices. They can quite often be quite um, quite devoid so um but we're, we're working with um bumblebee conservation trust on a project in uh in gwent called the living levels project and we're doing like a little sub project called pollinating the levels and there's um a housing developer down there who who are working with us or more so with bumblebee conservation trust because shrill cardby records are nearby and they want to try and make some you know decent habitat around around there i think it might be st Maudwin. um uh and i know some some of the bigger sort of um uh, housing construction companies, you know, do do work with NGOs on, on occasion. So, you know, it'd be good to see more of that, basically. So it's, it's in there and it's in the design from, from the start. It's all down to money, though, when it's coming to development sites, I think. A lot of it is, yeah. Yeah, for sure. But it doesn't have to be more expensive. And sometimes it can be cheaper because, you know, typically areas will get topsoiled and, you know, seeded and stuff and that that can be quite expensive to do whereas if you just yeah. use it what what you've got there already and allowing it to sort of you know do it do its own thing that can be better but it takes time and it doesn't always look pretty or aesthetically pleasing which again is is a challenge sometimes yeah. talking of connectivity um how does how does this link in with plant life's road verge campaign i mean the the, the figure they give for the area of road verge in Wales that could be species rich is absolutely vast. It's mm -hmm. um, and yet it's councils say, well, if we don't cut the road verges every few weeks, people complain that it looks untidy. Um, so it, it it isn't that they can't afford to make them species rich. It's they actually spend more money on making them species poor, but the public <laughs> doesn't like it if they don't cut them. Yeah, that that's a huge, huge battle. And I think there are, you know, it, it is changing a bit. And I think the, the past year when, especially at the early um, phases of lockdown, where we literally ground to a halt for that, those first few months, obviously areas just, just didn't get cut. And, um, you know, you were seeing lots of wildflower verges pop up where it would have just been pretty much mown to death. So I think hopefully that's, yeah. that's opened up the eyes of um, some local authorities um, and, you know, other reasons that are cited for are uh, yes, you know, they may get complaints or, you know, it could be sight lines at particular areas of a road where it's really important. But again, you know, much, much more can be done. Um, and in a lot of cases, it can be um, a money saving thing. So if it's only cut, for example, two or three times a year, sometimes the challenge can come in because what you need to do when, when you're cutting these areas collect is the cutting, the cuttings um, yeah. and, you know, yeah. Local authorities may not have the kit or it may be expensive then if they need to, to transport the cut-ins 
somewhere. Sometimes you can get, yeah. if you can dispose them on site, then all the better, where, you know, in situ where you are. So, so that can be a bit of a barrier. Um, but um, Monmouthshire County Council um, have done, um, have done lots of good work for, on this type of thing. And they did a sort of case study demonstrating like how many tens of thousands they've saved by amending their yeah. mowing regimes. So, you know, yeah. it, it can depend on on local situations but but it, it can also be really effective for for pollinators for people as well to enjoy the wildflower areas and and financially to to the local authority so there are certainly ways around it and i know um neith Talbot council are you know looking into their their sort of verge management and you know trying to highlight key ones that you know that can be left uncut to to flower um, and i'm sure lots of other councils are yeah across. At, at the the uh, WBP conference uh, that was all online, so a lot more people probably went to it for that reason. Yeah. There were some very good talks by um, people from local authorities who were responsible for maintaining road verges on... Uh, I mean, there is, as you say, an initial investment on getting the, the machinery that will cut and collect it, Um but every few years they're going to be replacing the machinery anyway so they can factor it in and there's a lot of experience of some authorities that have done it already like Monmouthshire and I think Denbyshire as well is quite good in that, mm. in that respect um, yeah. but uh, yeah well that's just one example um, the uh, the the map you showed also the the early map of of when you did this sort of uh study in pembrokeshire um my wife and i do a lot of walking on the coast path around pembrokeshire and yeah nice. we're never sure whether it's because there's this strip where there isn't farming going on or whether it's because there's the land one side and the sea the other and all these invertebrates get to the coast <laughs> path and then they realize oh we well, better not go out there we're going <laughs> to drown but there's so much more uh, biodiversity plants and invertebrates in this narrow strip all the way around the coast yeah yeah and you'll notice from the well the uk map in the wales is the same is that the coastline always comes up really strongly in terms yeah. of suitable habitat. Um, funnily enough, I was in Pembrokeshire for a couple of days with a colleague surveying uh, last week, and I was just there on, on holiday over the weekend. So um, up near, near Newport and then down at Castle Martin. And um, I, well, I got to St. David's most years and walk the coast path there. So, um, and it, yeah, it's an amazing area. And um, yeah, so you've got, you know, obviously in some instances you do have the sort of farmland coming quite close, but what you, you typically get there is the natural flora is just so yeah. so amazing along those areas. Um, and just thinking about solitary bees and oil beetles, for example, yes. it's um, the coast path. This is like the hotspot to, to see them. And like we saw tiger, tiger beetles on the weekend, yeah. the species that really love those open sort of um, open bare areas, but then next to, to grassy areas, flower rich areas, there might be a bit of heathland, some grassland, you know, it's that sort of juxtaposition of habitats and you've got the cliffs themselves and the cliff faces. So yeah, it, it is a bit of a sort of pinch point for biodiversity if you if you like. And uh, yeah, I know the Pems Coast National Park Authority are sort of managing their sort of areas of the, of the coast path to try and sort of maximize that sort of mosaic type of um, habitat uh, approach. So um, yeah, it's an amazing part of the world. I love Pembrokeshire. <laughs> How can, can you um, achieve connectivity across something like the M4? I mean, what happens with your B lines? Can they go across the M4? Well, yeah, they do cross roads, um, uh, you know, and it's, it's difficult to sort of avoid that really, particularly at, at sort of the, you know, scale we're working Little at. Little roads, yeah, but what about great big roads? <laughs> yeah, they do on a, yeah, they, some of them they just, they just do. Um, yeah. And, you know, yes, there'll be, there'll be casualties, but obviously, you know, a lot of them can just sort of fly, um, 
it's it's a tricky one really because i know there's there's studies that have shown like bumblebees and some other you know ground active species not necessarily pollinators who will actively avoid roads so if roads are in crucial areas and bisecting areas then that that is a big impact on on their dispersal and in some instances you know particularly with things flying across the roads is going to quote you know increase more mortality so and it's a similar argument i guess with road verges you're saying well you know making road verges wildflower rich to attract pollinators that's great but then it's also bringing them close to to traffic so it's sort of weighing up you know the pros and cons to that but i think you know given the state of of nature that we are in at the minute i think the, the benefits yeah certainly outweigh the, the the negative side in it so yeah so it, it is a bit of an issue um but you know we we did the, i think actually it may well be the the previous talk to yours uh was uh julia osborne from exeter university and um their group has done work on species rich road verges and what gets used there and by what and um i had to pay attention because she used to be my boss so uh, <laughs> i had to listen to what she was saying but uh, it, it seems that the the one or two meters nearest the traffic which most uh, on most road verges is always mown short anyway but even if it's not, it is of least interest to mm. uh, the invertebrates. And the um, this is talking about busy roads and bigger roads, but then they have bigger verges. Um, yeah, typically. Uh, you know, a little, a, a small little unclassified road or a, a very minor road uh, doesn't have much traffic anyway. And, no. you know, whether you're a... Uh, a, a small invertebrate flying across it or a hedgehog walking across it you're going to be very unlucky if you get hit yeah yeah for sure yeah, so yeah, i think that you know the size of the road makes a difference yes yeah for sure uh anyone else got anything to raise okay if not well let's thank uh, Claire very much uh, it was a fascinating talk it's very interesting and, and we'll all be abusing the, the drop down menus on the <laughs> Beeline's system to register our site yeah so. well um, yeah my email is on the presentation as I say I can send you a PDF of it so if you that think that'd be like, brilliant yes yeah, yeah no excellent. problem so if you uh, if you do get around to trying it out and you're like this just doesn't fit my site then please do send me an email <laughs> and I can go to my colleague and go but look this is what's happening in Carbonshire we need to sort this out <laughs> yeah so thank you very much indeed Claire no, it, it was fascinating it was great so uh I'm going to we have recorded the talk and and I'll I'll edit out the bit where you disappeared and then I'll put the rest on our YouTube oh, channel. Nice uh, one. <laughs> so, so okay, I think I think we're done then. So thank you very much again, Claire, and thank no you. No Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, guys. I'll see you again. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Good night. Take care. Uh, bye. Bye. Oh, that was it.